Kosher wine, the McDonald's of vino, right? Imagine bringing a bottle to your friend's tasting party. How have Jews managed to win over 100 Nobel Prizes, cure polio, and create the Marvel Universe, but screw up wine? Actually, they didn't. Despite dozens of awards, the Manischewitz stigma is real. But what's crazy is that there was a time when Manischewitz was absurdly popular in non-Jewish communities. Manischewitz, look at that go. See that? It's a wild story, but first, we need to talk a little about history. During the years of the Kingdom of Israel, kosher wine was a big export to the Greek and then Roman civilizations. When Rome expelled the Jews in 70 CE, it was a major blow to kosher winemaking in the region. In the 7th century, Muslim conquerors took over the land and, enforcing the Quran's ban on alcohol, they uprooted the Jewish vineyards. With few exceptions, kosher wine would be relegated to small Jewish communities in the diaspora. Fast forward to the mid-19th century and the cultivation of a grape that would change Jewish wine forever. Say hello to this little guy, the Concord grape. It's cheap, easy to grow, and resistant to difficult growing conditions, such as too much rain and chilly weather. So if, say, you're a poor Jewish immigrant living in New York, it just might scratch your wine itch. Now, the Concord grape is high in acidity, meaning if you simply ferment it into wine, it's going to be sour. You're going to need a good amount of sugar to balance it out. Hence, that overly sweet taste that has become so synonymous with kosher wine. In 1920, the United States institutes prohibition. The production, import, and sales of all alcohol is banned, with the exception of wine for religious purposes. Suddenly, there is a huge demand for kosher wine, but government limits become so stringent that there is hardly enough wine to go around to drink the required four cups on Passover. Once prohibition ends in 1933, demand for kosher wine skyrockets. Ready and eager to meet that demand was the Monarch Wine Company. The founders wanted a name that was well-known in the Jewish world to set them apart. So they reached out to the Manischewitz Food Company to license the name. And thus we have the birth of the wine we all remember from Passover at Grandma's. Then something weird happened. Monarch noticed that while Jews bought a lot of their wine around Passover, they were doing great in certain non-Jewish areas at other times of the year as well. Bottles had been selling during Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, and St. Patrick's Day. As it turns out, Manischewitz had been popular in many black communities. Evidently, the Concord grape is very similar to the Scuppernong grapes of the South, where sweet drinks on a hot summer day were king. When African Americans moved into then Jewish neighborhoods like Harlem, the familiar sweet taste, the religious imagery on the bottle, and the slogan, wine like mother used to make, struck all the right chords. It wasn't long before liquor stores were being asked if they sold that manny wine. With business booming, Monarch pursued the non-Jewish sales hard. In particular, the African American market. So break out the wine and let's drink a toast to the best there be, the humble shabbats. Almanetta, gentle Almanetta, Almanetta for Manischewitz wine. At one point, 85% of their magazine advertising budget went to Ebony Magazine alone. The marketing was so successful that in 1981, Forbes published a piece identifying blue-collar African Americans as the primary consumer over traditional Jews. With its astounding success, Manischewitz had begun turning its back on Jewish consumers. Then the 80s and the quality revolution happened. Wine tastes switched to French and California styles of dry wine. Even the blue-collar demographic was gravitating towards the new, sophisticated palate. This sent Manischewitz sales into a tailspin. Meanwhile, back in Israel in the 1800s, philanthropists such as Sir Moses Montefiore and Baron Edmund de Rothschild made tremendous contributions to what would become a thriving wine boom, buying land and introducing French grapes to the region. At one time, there were as many as 26 wineries in the old city of Jerusalem alone. The Shore brothers even grew their grapes in a back alley opposite the Western Wall. Although most of those wineries are gone, a few still remain and are staples of the Israeli industry today. Carmel, Tupperberg, and the Shore Brothers, which split into Zion, Arza, and Hakromim. In the 1970s, a professor from the University of California visited the Golan Heights and discovered that the soil and altitude were ideal for growing quality grapes. This sets the stage for Israel's part in the quality revolution of the 1980s. Shortly after, the Golan Heights Winery is founded and pioneers such wines as Pinot Noir, Cab Franc, and Viognier. Then, in 1987, their Yarden Cabernet Sauvignon turns heads as it is awarded not only a gold medal at the International Wine and Spirits Competition in London, but also the Winiarski Trophy for Best Red Wine at the competition. The quality revolution of the 80s leads to the Israeli boutique boom of the 90s, where smaller vineyards revolutionize viniculture and viticulture techniques even further. 
Israeli wineries start getting more notoriety and awards from wine spectator Robert Parker and Hugh Johnson. And in the 2000s, the big wineries decide they want a piece of the quality pie and up their game too. Today, the industry in Israel is huge. There are the big advanced wineries, the inexperienced but passionate boutique wineries, Moshav and Kibbutz wineries, ultra-Orthodox wineries, Christian monks, and even an Arab-Israeli family runs a kosher winery. Not to mention the U.S., where kosher wineries such as Baron Herzog, Hagafen from Napa Valley, and even boutique-style wineries like Santa Barbara's Shiraz have received acclaim and notoriety. The Manischewitz brand still has major cross-cultural appeal, even today, popular in Jamaica, Asia, and still skewing to Hispanic and Black communities in the U.S. There are even trendy cocktails that use the sweet grape wine. Next time you're at the bar, try asking for a Maccabee blood. Meanwhile, the kosher wine industry's growth in Israel is happening hyper-fast. Global supply can't meet demand. The point is, you may associate kosher wine with a cough syrup taste and consistency, but kosher wine has come a long way, even if Jews aren't always the ones drinking it. Thanks for watching. If you like what we're doing here, consider subscribing, and if there's something you want us to tackle in an upcoming video, let us know in the comments.